And um, of course, our uh, desire always as scientists to speak of science. So um, that was my first instinct. But of course, since this is a conference on software, then I thought I would talk about software primarily um, as a means, hopefully, of getting us uh, to our scientific goals. So um, to get started, um, please, me... please share your screen. Yeah. Oh, is it not showing? I was I was sharing something else. It is sharing. Oh, okay. It is sharing. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, just a big picture. If you have to leave and um, uh, go uh, to bed, um, I know Sacher is probably very late right now. Um, then, really, the main takeaway is that accelerated HPC is really ubiquitous nowadays, and this is something that we have to take seriously. I resisted for a long time, and I think we all collectively did, but I think this is something that we have to tackle. Um, and it's everywhere. Uh, it started out at exascale, as I will um, demonstrate, but really a revolution is happening across all scales, including your lab scale. Um, and it gives us Challenges, of course, um, transitioning to these complicated architectures is complicated uh, for a reason, but it also gives us an opportunity. And this is something that we really have to do um, in, in any case uh, to reach um, higher compute densities and to take advantage of higher compute densities and also to reach higher energy efficiency and so on. So this is a community-wide challenge. And I think this is an appropriate topic to bring here. Okay, so first I will discuss why accelerated HPC. Uh, really, we're just slaves to uh, much larger trends um, in HPC. We are not the drivers. Um, I wish that were the case. In some domains, we are perhaps at the exascale, but maybe even there, uh, we're not the drivers anymore. Uh, so we have to adapt. And then I will uh, talk, uh, give you a couple stories on our, some of the work we've been doing on uh, porting tensor algebra dance and as well as uh, sparse tensor algebra on the accelerated architectures. So why accelerated computing? Well, first of all, um, as someone who is tasked with um, thinking about porting chemistry software on the largest machines in the world, uh, this is something that is our number one priority right now because at the high end, um, HPC is dominated by heterogeneous architectures. Heterogeneous means you have multiple compute units, but they all live essentially in different um, address spaces. They have different memory spaces. And uh, programming, programming them becomes complicated for that reason. So this is an example of a machine that uh, we're tasked to uh, write our software for. Uh, this is going to be a Frontier. Uh, 1.5 approximately uh, exaflop machine, uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 18 uh, flops. Uh, so roughly about um, a million times uh, more powerful than let's say a typical desktop nowadays. And that's uh, supposed to arrive late next year, early 2022. Um, it's going to have four AMD GPUs in it. Uh, it's gonna have a uh, regular CPU, of course, what nowadays is regular CPU is debatable, um, and it's gonna have very high density. Uh, so it's unlike the current number one machine in the world, which is more, more of a step back in time, um, very massively parallel, lots of compute nodes. This is gonna be relatively few nodes, but the nodes are very beefy. Um, the other exascale machine that was supposed to be number one in the US at least, um, got delayed, that's the Aurora, uh, but it's gonna have very similar architecture. On paper, it may look different, but in practice, it's gonna be a multi-accelerator uh, machine. Very heavy nodes, very fat nodes, as I call them, uh, relatively few of them, okay? Uh, but as I mentioned, these are not the primary reason to care about the exascale. Really, it's happening everywhere. Um, an average cluster at Virginia Tech already has a bunch of GPU equipped nodes. And nowadays, every laptop, of course, comes with the GPU that can in principle be, in most cases, be uh, exploited for computation. 
Uh, one I'm particularly excited about is the Apple Silicon, this M1 chip, which is basically an ARM architecture, uh, a big step away from the traditional Intel-based architecture for Apple. Um, it, it is extremely heterogeneous machine. Even in the CPU space, it's heterogeneous. It's got four high power CPU cores and four low power CPU cores. Um, it also has a GPU, also has a neural engine. This is the type of an architecture that we are to expect really from um, even mainstream um, computing uh, going forward. So as, as takeaway is most computing is becoming accelerated computing. All right, so as I said, there are challenges and opportunities. So what are the opportunities, first of all? Really, the way to think about accelerated HPC is not really that different. The line has blurred significantly. Um, perhaps the um, introduction of custom hardware or special purpose hardware uh, is the really the main distinguishing feature. But in terms of how to think about what a GPU is, it's just a multi-core machine. It's just programming it is very different and it lives it has its own address space, it has its own memory. Um, let's compare, let's say, a, a, a late 2017 uh, Intel Xeon processor. It's got essentially one tenth, one ninth um, the floating point 64 units um, of the NVIDIA. It run, those units though run at higher frequency. Um, it has smaller transistor budget, but I mean, relatively speaking, these are comparable parts. Yes, okay, except they cost roughly the same thing. So um, you get higher energy efficiency and you also get more compute units for the same dollar um, in the case of NVIDIA. These are slower compute units, but in the end, you still win out. Now, it, so in principle, if we reach the same efficiency on a conventional CPU and on a, an, an accelerator, then in principle, we should win out uh, by um, significant margin. Okay. However, of course, the difficulties are is that the programming models are fundamentally different. Um, even though you can write code for performing tasks within the accelerator that may look like conventional um, synchronous code, but ultimately it's always, almost always going to look very different. And from the standpoint of you at the higher level, from you composing your application, um, you're going to write it as a bunch of tasks. You're going to have to decompose your um, program into a bunch of tasks that are cooperating. Essentially, the model is instead of walking, your code is walking through line by line and each line is executed. Then you go on to the next line, the previous line has already finished. That's not how it is. Um, that's a synchronous model. Here, you push some data in explicitly. You launch some tasks in the device then you check back later on the status of that. So it's asynchronous. You, you have to, uh, you don't uh, expect the task to be completed until late. The problem of course right now is that the programming models are relatively immature. Um, they're mostly vendor specific, although um, I have to say the development of Sickle is quite exciting. That's an attempt to um, have a single source uh, industry standard uh, way to program these devices. But, um, Effectively, right now we have to target CUDA, HIP, and Sickle, and or DPC++. That, that's the Intel extension of Sickle uh, separately. Um, the biggest challenge, of course, as you'll see, is memory constraints. Um, the, the fact that the memory is a disjoint and you have to explicitly manage uh, that di disjointness um, is a significant bottleneck for our codes. Uh, but it's also an opportunity because there's memory bandwidth on the accelerator is significantly higher than that on the CPU typically. Um, but the amount of that really, really fast memory is very, very small. In that sense, actually, number one machine in the world now, Fugaku, uh, is similar in that sense to accelerators. It only has about um, a few gigabytes, a few, um, um, a few tens of gigabytes uh, per few teraflops. So it's a very memory limited machine and, and really takes me back to the days of IBM Blue Gene Q, um, where you had lots of cores and relatively little memory per node and you have lots of nodes, right? So uh, for on a V100, NVIDIA's current mass sort of most uh, common accelerator, 
uh, you have 16 gigabytes of RAM. And that's not very much. All right, so, but the way we think about accelerators, really, we need to think of them as the result of an evolution, not revolution. Again, the changes are there, uh, especially on the programming model side. But in terms of what matters, really, what we have to worry about are the same things we really had to worry about, the HPC people had to worry about on the CPU side as well. It's the uh, vast importance of the instruction and data parallelism. These are just really wide Cindy machines with lots of cores. V100 has roughly equivalent of a, um, 100 cores or more, uh, depending on how you think about it, uh, with each uh, core uh, having 16 wide vector units, multiple 16 wide vector units. Okay. Um, you need to have task parallelism. Uh, you have to worry about flops, um, actually mops, memory operations, often not flops. Uh, you want to worry about data reuse. Uh, if, if you can do something using integers, not floats, do it. It's going to be cheaper. If you can do something uh, floats, not doubles, do it, and so on. So these are the same things uh, that really will um, you have to worry about on the CPU. So nothing new there. But nevertheless, because of the massive scale of the accelerators and also the memory constraints that I mentioned, and also the complexity of programming, some methods may be less suitable for accelerators. So I think that's where the opportunity for us as a field is, is to um, consider multiple pivots uh, and say, well, you know, for these types of architectures, these methods may be um, more beneficial than others. So uh, there was a nice talk by, um, a couple talks actually earlier uh, about stochastic methods in this um, conference. They sure gave a nice talk on stochastic uh, couple cluster. Uh, well, it's not really stochastic, it's sparse, right? Uh, but that can be thought of as a pivot, right? Stochastic versus non stochastic. Um, some methods may be more difficult to port to accelerators due to their really wide uh, vector unit. Um, the choice of representation, whether we use plane waves versus LCAOs versus real space and so on. And one that uh, is particularly common when discussing uh, massively parallel machines is the ease of parallelism and of fragment methods. So uh, that one, I just wanted to say a few words uh, since we've done quite a bit of work on um, reduced scaling approaches. Also, Mark uh, Gordon gave a nice talk on uh, their recent work on, on the exascale version of games. And uh, uh, their choice is really to go in the fragment direction. And the way I think about fragment methods is um, you essentially, by explicitly chopping up uh, the system a priori, you have, um, in some sense, are doing, uh, you're trying to reproduce the result of a full calculation by patching together um, calculations that are embedded in some way. The, the most trivial way is where there is no embedding and these are completely independent. Of course, we know that electrostatics needs to be included and so on. Ultimately, all the flavors of fragment methods end up being uh, some sort of embedding. Uh, these are redundant, uh, but simpler. So for iterative methods, um, what you have to do is due to the fact that each fragment needs a bath around it, um, that bath, uh, the, those baths will overlap for, for fragments that are near each other. And so, unavoidably, you're gonna have some redundancy in it. What I call monolithic approaches, such as PNO, couple cluster, and so on, uh, these are non-redundant, but these are more complex because now you have compressed the wave function. You're working in a more complicated representation. Um, and ultimately, you're trying to compute a single wave function. There's really no such thing as embedding, um, if you will. Uh, these can be identical for, uh, let's say, perturbative methods. For iterative methods, there are advantages to going the monolithic way. And so really, to me, the, the choice between them is not really the ease of parallelism. I think both of them can be parallelized, but it's really about technical simplicity versus error control. If you want the error control, um, it's easier to get in monolithic approaches. But certainly from te technical simplicity, fragment approaches uh, win out. Okay, so... As I mentioned, there are opportunities really to tailor our tools for the evolution of hardware to consider, well, you know, what's the hardware going to look like in five years, 10 years, and try to imagine which methods are going to be, are going to port better uh, to that type of hardware and so on. Because remember, we don't really drive the evolution of hardware. We could also, um, with the, 
Availability of custom hardware, we can, when we design our HPC setups, we can say, okay, we want this many, these types of GPUs and so on. We care about tensor units, maybe not, and so on. All right, so let's talk about software a little bit. Um, I'll give you my perspective. So I will talk about software I know, I, I work on, and, and that's essentially our research code, MPQC, although we contribute to quite a few other codes such as Orca and so on. And then the components that we develop, such as Tiled Array and Libbin, uh, they're used by other codes as well, especially Libbin uh, is used by Orca and CP2K and so on. Um, I will not have time to talk about um, porting Libbin to accelerators, uh, but recently we've done some work on porting uh, integrals for density fitting to accelerators. Um, <clears throat> that's what we call Libbin X. Uh, and there are some uh, promising results where um, density fitting Coulomb construction is um, extremely efficient. But I'll primarily talk about tensor algebra today, and that's the work on tiled array. If you're interested in learning about NPQC, uh, then a recent JCP article, please refer to that. Okay, so uh, tiled array, um, many of you have probably heard me uh, discuss tiled array. It's, it's a tensor framework or tensor library. Um, not really sure what to call it. Um, uh, that we've been developing for a long time simply because we did not really see that computer scientists are going to drop something like that in our labs um, anytime soon. And the goal was always to uh, focus on um, higher end machines without sacrificing efficiency of, on, on lower end machines. So uh, I think it's been um, quite um, interesting experience in the end, but I think we've been quite successful um, it's an open source uh, tensor framework. It supports dense and block sparse tensor computation. It's very much general purpose. Uh, so it does not have any uh, domain specific concepts in it, which is maybe a plus, maybe a minus. Uh, it's got high level C++ uh, DSL in it for easy composition. So for a lot of classes of tensor algebra, it, it can be used as easily as EinSum. Um, it's very generic. so. Um, um, for example, uh, introducing heterogeneous backend really required just injecting a, a tensor, a, a tile type, uh, for example. And it's efficient um, on CPUs and, and um, on the GPUs, at least in, in some contexts. Uh, some recent developments I wanted to highlight, but we'll not have time to talk about it. Uh, Python API has been added. Uh, both EINSOM style and also generalized EINSOM where uh, there's a DSL-like support. Uh, more importantly, support for tested tensors that, that is being developed in the context of NWK MAX project and heterogeneous, this is really the topic of today's uh, conversation. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about tensor algebra and distributed heterogeneous platforms. And first I wanted to start out with the simplest example, the canonical uh, parenthesis T method um, that uh, we implemented on distributed memory heterogeneous machines um, um, that was a year and a half ago or so. Um, and there were some interesting lessons that I wanted to highlight. So um, we only implemented closed shell uh, parenthesis T method, but uh, the same uh, lessons really can be taken away. And most of you have seen this, so this is nothing new. This is n to the seventh method in canonical representation. So it really boils down to this uh, tensor contraction right here that forms this intermediate W. And then that is the reduction. So you have freedom to parallelize and there are plenty of people in the audience, um, maybe now still, uh, who were pioneers in developing this on parallel machines. And the very first step, when we looked at this, we said, how are we gonna port this? And we said, okay, we can do the tensor contraction in the GPU, let's just move that. And is it sufficient to just move the expensive terms to the GPU? Well, it turns out not really, as we'll see. Um, however, um, I just wanted to, actually, let me skip to the next one. Okay, so um, that was the first version of the code that we uh, implemented. And the performance was disappointing to say the least. Essentially, moving only parts of the computation onto the accelerator, in this case, simply does not make the, um, does not give you any speed up because even though formally this is the most expensive term, uh, the overhead of the rest of the terms plus the overhead of transferring the data 
onto the GPU um, kills you. So then <clears throat> we realized the permutations um, would be actually good candidates for moving to the device as well. And that's what we did next. That was our second version. And then we did see a significant improvement in the performance. Um, for the first time, we saw speed up relative to the CPU only version. Um, however, uh, the next step is we realized we did not manage the memory efficiency. So remember our discussion of memory measurement. That was the biggest actually bottleneck. And I think that's the biggest uh, problem as us, especially in the non-Fortran programmers, we're used to the memory allocators being relatively uh, efficient. Certainly that's not the case. You essentially have to manage the memory more in a Fortran style. So the Fortran people actually are at an advantage there thinking of you pre-allocate all the memory and then you just manage the pool yourself. We C++ C++ programmers are spoiled by availability of malloc. Under the hood, it does the same thing. Um, ultimately, once we poured the whole thing to the GPU, then we actually have quite efficient code that gives us reasonable speed ups. So for um, something like um, ibuprofen molecule, I picked that just because there was there are some numbers for Gaussian available at the time, but I have not seen really the um, CUDA release uh, of Gaussian's capability, um, which was quite favorable. Bottom line is the use of the GPUs gives you significant speed up and actually makes, in this case, the parenthesis T calculation faster than the conventional CPU uh, CCSD. Um, this of course uh, was done using tiled array and um, the code was scalable as well. And we obtained a reasonable speed up but again, as you probably already know, Princess T is a relatively easy computation to parallelize simply because the ratio, the surface uh, to volume ratio is, uh, is quite favorable in this case. Okay, so then our next step was to say, let's port the entire couple cluster to the um, heterogeneous platforms. And the biggest challenge there, of course, is again, the tensor contraction, but on, Unlike in parenthesis T case, it's not coarse grain parallelizable. But how do, how do we think about tensor contraction? At least how I thought about this is essentially this is a matrix multiplication. It can be mapped into it by permutations. And distributed dense matrix multiplication is well understood. And we exploited that. The tensor contraction is tiled array. And tiled array utilizes the uh, Van der Gaines algorithm essentially for matrix multiplication, for, for tensor contraction. Uh, and since the dense tensor contraction, therefore, is trivial, we should be able to do it well. It's mostly true on CPU, but really depends on sizes and shapes. And uh, it's not really clear that the same lesson applies on accelerated platforms. So in the last couple of minutes, just wanted to highlight some of the recent work we've done on the more general uh, tensor contraction on massively parallel heterogeneous architecture. Certainly, uh, right now, again, um, our target are high-end machines, but the goal is to develop the code uh, su such that it performs well on more modest setups. Uh, this is the current, uh, really, test bed for us, the Summit supercomputer. Again, a bunch of fat nodes. Uh, since I'll be talking about GPUs and, and numbers of them, um, the, I wanted to explain that each node has six GPUs in this case. That's quite significant. Um, and the smallest unit really that makes sense to use is three GPUs at the time, so simply because they, they live in the same, they're attached to the same uh, NUMA domain. So um, remember I mentioned it should be, it's possible to do dense matrix multiplication really well on a parallel machine. Well, it turns out on heterogeneous machines, only recently high percentage of peak has been demonstrated. Um, and that's by my collaborators, uh, George Basilka, Thomas Rowe, who are part of the ICL um, at the University of Tennessee, who are, of course, authors of BLOSS and LAPAC and so on. Uh, and using their uh, parsec runtime and the G plasma linear algebra, um, or scale LAPAC, uh, essentially, re-implementation, they were able to demonstrate high percentage of peak, um, up, up greater than 80% of the peak on this machine. This is really the first time, actually, this was done only about a year ago. So actually, even the dense square matrix multiplication is quite complicated. Um, on more modest setups, uh, that was actually our first goal is to, to, to do this well for dense square matrix multiplication. And our initial uh, 
Um, implementation of it using Parsec as the backend on top of the, under the tiled array uh, showed that indeed we can get reason, a good speed ups, um, but the percentage of the peak that we achieve on commodity hardware actually is quite a bit lower uh, due to uh, partially lower host device bandwidth, uh, but some of it is just quality of implementation. Um, then we switched our attention to the tensor contractions and the CCSD. And the first one, of course, is the particle-particle ladder, the ABCD term. This is conventional. And that one actually performs quite well, especially when we use the um, Parsec backend. That's what we call TESI and PQC. Uh, in this case, you can get a, uh, almost 28 speed up uh, from one GPU on one node to um, two GPUs on uh, on, on each of the 16 nodes. So it's quite um, favorable speed up, but the percentage of peak is uh, significantly lower, about 20 something percent. So the further improvements are still necessary. Okay, so I have really one minute. So very quickly, I just wanted to say, really the goal is actually uh, not the dense couple cluster methods, of course, but the um, efficient reduced scaling methods. And they are quite a bit more complicated. This is an example of some of the work we've, uh, we've done recently extending the OpenShell DLPNO uh, CC code, uh, uh, adding the explicitly correlated capability, which gave us ability to compute at essentially the basis set limit uh, CCSD parentheses T energies for uh, very large systems with hundreds of atoms on essentially a single uh, node. Um, Porting such methods is essentially our number one task right now, especially as part of this NWCAM EX project that I mentioned. But unfortunately, reduced scaling many body methods are going to be difficult to port to such machi machines. And it's certainly an open and fair question to ask, is it going to be viable? Some of the work we've done to this end actually demonstrates that block sparse tensor contraction is indeed viable on heterogeneous uh, architectures. So this is an example we've done recently uh, using, again, the Parsec backend. Uh, we, instead of doing a PNO type uh, couple cluster, this is an atomic orbital basis type couple cluster. And we looked at the single uh, contraction here. So these are extremely sparse matrices. Um, really, the sparsities are on the order of a few percent. Uh, these are irregularly tiled and uh, irregular sparsity patterns. These are very non-square. Um, multiplication. So these are, again, do not fit well the conventional SUMA. Uh, there's also the choice of tiling. There is no such thing as unique tiling. And these, even, even though we take advantage of the sparsity, the tensors are too large to fit into an accelerator. So uh, we obtained some reasonable uh, speed ups actually uh, on Summit going from three GPUs to 108. Um, it's a factor of 120. 12.7 uh, speed up, so roughly 30 something um, percent efficiency. Um, and the interesting thing is using the less dense tiling leads to higher performance. So this is definitely something to watch out is that on accelerated architectures, sometimes it, it, you may want to sacrifice some of the sparsity uh, to maximize the performance. Of course, how that relates to power, that's an open question. So this is where I wanted to stop.